So first of all, why are we considering time? So this morning you will have done phylogenetics and you will have made trees. Uh, you would have been considering the genetic distance between sequences. But in fact you can make trees considering time between sequences. And in particular this is important for pathogen genomes. So here we have <coughs> my view of the, of the world. So we have RNA viruses, DNA viruses and bacteria. And the RNA viruses, they have a fast and error-prone replication. Um, DNA viruses are slower and more conserved and to my mind bacteria are very slow. Of course, compared to bigger eukaryotes like mammals, that, that's not true at all. But in terms of pathogens, I think of bacteria as evolving slowly. The genome size. So RNA viruses are really small and that's partly why they can, they can go fast. DNA viruses are larger, up to um, a few hundred kilobases and bacteria are a few megabases long. If you consider along that whole genome how many mutations you might expect in a year, for RNA viruses these replicate really quickly. So you could have between 10, a few tens, even up to 100 mutations across the whole genome in a year. For DNA viruses, although they have larger genomes, they, they do have a, um, a slower mutation rate. So perhaps only up to about 20 or so. And for bacteria, just within a year, they're much slower. But you still, you might expect one, maybe one mutation. And o over a period of a few years, there might still be yet a few. <coughs> So if you consider the type of viruses that you, know, you might actually be interested in, um, I'm interested in livestock diseases, so, um, so the RNA viruses, things like classical swine fever, foot and mouth disease, are uh, fast mutating RNA viruses. So also is avian influenza and Schmallenberg. For DNA viruses, African swine fever, that's a larger virus, mutates more slowly and for bacteria, you might want to consider something like the bovine tuberculosis. And again, even though it mutates slowly, only a, maybe one mutation a year, if you were doing a study over a period of 10 years, you would yet still see a fair few mutations. So, <coughs> also this morning, you were um, learning about strain type for the pathogens. Well now I want to consider the actual sequences of the pathogens. So this is now not the MLS T type. This is now the full sequence I want to consider. And on the left here you have um, a short uh, view of an alignment. Each row is a different strain and each column is a position in the genome for that alignment. And you can see that there are some columns which are all the same and these are conserved positions and some columns where there are a few mutations. If you make a tree of the mutations, and in the middle we have an absolute classic example, this is human influenza in humans. Um, the tree has been made, it's actually just a neighbour joining tree, and we'll explain a bit about that later. Um, and the colours, each dot is a sequence, so there are um, a few hundred sequences here, each dot is sequence, and the colour of the dot is the year in which a sequence was isolated. And you can see here there's like a progression. In fact, this is called a ladder-like tree. So there's a ladder-like progression from earlier time to later time as the virus is mutating. If we plot here the genetic distance of, say, the virus, this virus here, against the most ancestral virus, and we plot them over time, and we get this nice straight line of genetic distance over time. And this is showing a very nice molecular clock signal. <coughs> so the molecular clock signal, if we start off with one sequence, suppose this is wild type, it has no mutations, and we sequence two more isolates. Sequence one, that has one mutation different to the wild type. And sequence two 
has three mutations and notice they're actually in different positions to that first mutation to the wild type. And then we say, well, I know that I sequenced, I isolated this sequence in month one and this one in month three, and then I can start to plot my small time scale tree. Because with these branch lengths being in time and the and a clock rate in this case of one mutation a month. <coughs> in the practical, which you'll get a chance to look at this data later, um, this is a tree of 90 odd H5N1 sequences, uh, bird flu sequences, it's the haemagglutinin. Um, and you can see the structure of the tree and also these very ridiculous long names which you don't need to worry about. And here we can do uh, the same thing as I was just describing. So we're going to plot the genetic distance of each of the sequences against the ancestral roots. And again, you'll do this within your practical and you can see your nice, your nice straight line. The <coughs> showing a lovely linear relationship between our data and our genetic diversity. So this is gen genetic diversity up the side here time along the bottom but also you'll notice that the slope of that line actually gives you an estimate of the clock rate so in this case this clock rate estimates in numbers of substitutions per site per year and it's estimating at about five in a thousand per year so so any so if my sequence was a thousand long and um, I was considering a year time scale, I would expect about five mutations. <coughs> so with that clock rate, we can generate time scale trees. And I will tell you about this program called BEAST, which is a very important program. It's actually used in a lot of um, pathogen evolution studies. And there's quite a lot of um, aspects to this and as we talk through this program I'll introduce you to several really important concepts. So first of all what BEAST does is it takes sequence data with the isolation date of those sequences and it makes time scale trees and it does this in fact incorporating an idea from population genetics called the coalescent model. And again, I will be speaking shortly about coalescent models. <coughs> but to start with, BEAST, it actually stands for Bayesian Evolutionary Analysis by Sampling Trees. And you might ask, well, OK, what does this actually mean? Well, this morning, you came across the idea of one tree to describe the relationship between the sequences. And typically, this is generated by a neighbour joining algorithm or a maximum likelihood algorithm. So the neighbour joining algorithm is where you join the, most, the two most similar sequences together. And the maximum likelihood algorithm is where you try to find the best joining of the sequences together successively to make the tree. But suppose a slightly different tree was actually better or almost as good as the tree that you made through a more simple method. Suppose you just had to change a tree a tiny bit. Suppose you grouped A and B and C and D, say, but in actual fact, if you'd grouped B and C, then really that wouldn't have been so much different. And especially considering um, if your sequences were only a few mutations different to start with, perhaps you wouldn't have very much evidence to group A and B together anyways. So what BEAST does is it gives you not one tree, but a collection of many trees, all of which are pretty good. <coughs> so that's what the sampling tree part means. What does the Bayesian part mean? 